Mr. Secretary, thanks so much for taking your time. Um, in 2022, about 18,000 people from India have applied for political asylum in Austria. Uh, for several months, there was no other country with uh, more asylum seekers here. How would you explain that? Well, I, I mean, I don't know the numbers. Uh, if you say so, I have to take you at your word. Uh, but uh, my sense is that when it comes to irregular migration, uh, sometimes, you know, because these are done by uh, by uh, syndicates and gangs, you never know where they end up with. I think what's important uh, is not what happened in the past. It is that we have a commitment to ensure that movement and mobility is legal. Uh, we would like a regime, uh, an agreed regime for that. Uh, it's good for the global workplace. It's good for the Austrian economy. Uh, and we have, uh, that's one of the outcomes of my visit to Vienna. Another outcome is that you have assured Austria's foreign minister that India will take back all of its citizens uh, who will not get asylum in Austria, which will probably be almost 100%. How fast will this happen? You know, look, I, uh, in terms of our citizens, if they are proven to be our citizens, uh, we obviously have an obligation in that regard. But what is important for us is to validate the fact that uh, if there's somebody who's staying illegally, that they are our citizens. And if, they are, if there are citizens, usually we work it out between, between the governments concerned. I, you know, I can't give you a time frame on it because it depends on what is the uh, level of proof that is provided for us and uh, uh, what are the preparations on the Austrian side. Mm -hmm. So you did not agree on a time frame today? No, we didn't. Frankly, we didn't get into that kind of discussion. That is for the immigration uh, people to decide. As foreign ministers, what we did was to work out uh, and uh, agreed uh, mobility and movement uh, regime. So we were looking for solutions. Mm -hmm. We weren't into, uh, into uh, you know, uh, the details of returnees problem, that there are other people whose jobs it is to do that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the war in Ukraine. As you are well aware, the whole world noticed that India, as a very influential country, uh, has never publicly condemned Russia's assault and invasion into a neighboring country. Why is that so? Can you really be neutral in a war for which obviously one side bears all responsibility? Well, look, uh, I think in international relations, uh, the, you, you have uh, sometimes very complicated uh, situations. Uh, and uh, where we are concerned, uh, we have always taken the position that the way out is for uh, the countries concerned to get back to dialogue and to diplomacy. Uh, I'll come to, to that soon, but is this a and, complicated and, situation? Uh, is this really complicated? There's oh, just one big country invading its neighbour. No, look, uh, I, I can give you many instances of countries uh, who have uh, violated the sovereignty of another country. You know, uh, if I were to ask where Europe stood on a lot of those, I'm afraid I'll get a long silence. So, so uh, do understand one thing. At the end of the day, uh, we, we make judgments in foreign policy based on what we think are our long-term interests and what is good for the world. Um, but you and Prime Minister Modi have already said that regularly call on both sides to stop the war and to negotiate. However, can one really urge Ukraine to stop defending itself? After all, there are no Ukrainian tanks in Russia. There are Russian tanks and planes and missiles destroying Ukraine. I, I think that's a bit of a misrepresentation. Uh, I think what we do is to say, get back to dialogue and diplomacy. There was dialogue and diplomacy in the early days of the conflict. So it's not that it didn't happen. So it's not for us to put conditions and to say this country is equal to that country. You are, you, that's your judgment. But should you urge Russia to stop the war? I, I think we have been very clear that this conflict is not in anybody's interest, including this. But you wouldn't say it more explicitly? I'm a diplomat. It is my job to, to uh, conduct foreign policy which serves my uh, national interest and which serves what I believe is a long-term pathway towards uh, peace and uh, dialogue. Let's talk about India's interests. India does not take part in Western sanctions against Russia, but has increased its imports from Russia uh, five times since the war began. Uh, by this, are you not helping Moscow? Are you not financing Russia's war? You know, Europe imported, in the same period, six times the energy which India did. So but, if, but, yes, if but, you, but, Europe, is, uh, but Europe decreased its imports a lot and dramatically since well, the war started, you multiplied yours. No, essentially, if it is a matter of principle, why didn't Europe cut on the first day? 
Why didn't we see on 25th of February a complete cutoff of energy imports from Russia? But you, can't say, you can't say it's my principle, but by the way, I will do it by my timing. Okay, but isn't it the difference uh, between decreasing your imports but still making sure that uh, Europe is not freezing uh, to death in the winter or just increasing uh, your imports by five times? No. Uh, Europe has managed uh, to, uh, to reduce its imports while doing it in a manner in which it is comfortable for Europe. No, comfortable. If that, uh, comfortable, comfortable, it's may, manageable. Maybe a, comfortable no, it's manageable. may be a little bit of an uh, it's overstatement. Manageable. Now, if at 60,000 euros or whatever is your per capita income, you are so caring about your population, I have a population at $2,000. I also need energy. I don't have, I'm not in a position to pay high prices. The price of oil has doubled. So, and what Europe is doing is also moving into the Middle East and diverting production out of the Middle East into Europe and raising prices. So European actions actually are putting pressure on the global oil markets and on my uh, imports as well. So uh, I think it's something which, if European political leadership, understandably, would like to soften the impact on their population, I think it's a privilege they should extend to other political leaderships as well. Uh, are you reluctant toward Moscow um, as well because Russia is India's most important supplier of weapons and military equipment? And therefore? Uh, are you reluctant to criticize Moscow? No, I think, look, we have a relationship with Moscow. We've had a long-term relationship with Moscow. I think it's important to look at that history of the relationship. It was a relationship built in a period when Western democracies used to arm a military dictatorship called Pakistan and deny India defensive weapons. So if we are talking about principles, let's talk a little bit of history out here. So how did the Indian uh, exposure to Russia get, and previously to Soviet Union get built up? Because the Western uh, democracies, for whatever reason, decided that their natural partner in our part of the world was a military dictatorship. Would you consider India an ally of Russia? No, I think India doesn't... We are an independent country. Uh, we do not... Uh, uh, define ourselves or perceive ourselves in alliance terms. That's very much a Western terminology. It's not something, it's not a term that we use. Mm. Uh, before you said you're a diplomat, um, mm -hmm. but several weeks ago you called Pakistan, uh, your neighbor, the epicenter of terrorism. Well, I uh, did it again today uh, without using the word Pakistan. Uh, yes, and uh, th this uh, doesn't sound very diplomatic, does it? No, because you are a diplomat doesn't mean you're untruthful. Uh, I could use much harsher words than epicenter. So believe me, considering what has been happening to us, I think epicenter is a very diplomatic word because this is a country which has attacked uh, the parliament of India some years ago, which attacked the city of Mumbai, which went after hotels and foreign tourists, which every day sends uh, terrorists across the uh, border. But of so course sometimes not, when but we of talk- of course not as a country. Well, if you uh, control your sovereign space, which I believe they do, uh, if the terrorist camps operate in broad daylight in cities with recruitment and financing, uh, can you really tell me that the Pakistani state doesn't know what's going on? Especially if they're being trained in military level combat tactics. So, you know, when we speak about uh, judgments and principles, why don't I hear sharp European condemnation? of these practices which have been going on for multiple decades. Does the world have to be concerned that there someday will be a war between India and Pakistan? I think the world has to be concerned that there is terrorism going on and the world often looks away. Uh, the world often feels it's not my problem because it's happening to some other country. I think the world needs to be concerned about how sincerely and strongly it takes up the challenge of terrorism. But has the world to be concerned about the future war between India and Pakistan? I think the world needs to be concerned about terrorism. That's because, what you, you said. Know, yeah, sure. Because, look, if you pose it the way you do, if you pose it the way you do, that's like giving a free pass to terrorism, saying, you know, let's worry about the next consequence of it. I am worried about the terrorism. Okay, let's change the subject. You frequently said that India has a very complicated relationship with your neighboring China. Many people around the world are quite concerned that China might in the near future intervene militarily in Taiwan. Do you share this concern? 
I look, I think there's a, a larger concern uh, which is uh, based on our experiences. Uh, the concern is that uh, we had agreements with China not to mass forces uh, uh, on our, in our border areas. Uh, uh, and uh, they have not observed those agreements, which is why we have the currently tense situation that we do. Uh, we had an agreement not to unilaterally uh, change the line of control, uh, which they have uh, tried to unilaterally do that. Uh, so uh, there is, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, issue, a perception that we have, which derives directly from our experiences. Now, where else the status quo may change or not change, uh, you know, I, I would hesitate uh, as a foreign minister to predict publicly. I may have my own views uh, and assessments. Uh, but I certainly can share my experience, uh, and my experience is that uh, written agreements were not observed, uh, that uh, uh, we have seen levels of military pressure which, in our view, has no justification. China would say the opposite. They would say that uh, India uh, had not obeyed uh, different agreements, uh, uh, but obviously uh, you, uh, you see uh, No, it I think it's difficult for China to say that for this reason. Uh, the record is very clear because today, you know, there's a lot of transparency. You have satellite pictures. Uh, if you see who moved the forces uh, to the uh, border areas first, I think the record is very clear. So it's very difficult for China to say what you suggested they could. Mm. India will probably overtake China as the world's most populous country within mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. Is this fact of any political significance to India or is it just a mere statistic? You know, uh, it's, we'll, we'll know that when we reach there, won't we? Yeah, because uh, we have never used numbers in that manner. Uh, maybe other countries have. Uh, I would still, uh, I would still uh, say to a large extent it is a statistic, large extent, but uh, you will have a situation where the world's most populous country uh, is not among the permanent members of the Security Council. And what does it say about the state of the UN if that is the case? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's a kind of a, both a yes and a no. It's partly a statistic, but I think it's a statistic which means a lot. Mm -hmm. For several years, you have called for a permanent seat on the, on the Security Council, as have Brazil, as has uh, Japan or Germany. Uh, how long will it take, from your point of view, till this reform of the Council will actually become reality? Well, ideally, we'd like it yesterday. Of course. Uh, but, uh, uh, the problem, I think, is that uh, those uh, who are today enjoying the uh, benefits of permanent membership uh, clearly don't, are not in a hurry to, uh, to see reform. Uh, I think it's a very short-sighted view, in my opinion, because at the end of the day, the credibility of the UN and, frankly, their own interests and effectiveness uh, is at stake. Uh, so uh, my sense is uh, it will take some time, hopefully not too much time, uh, I can see a growing uh, body of opinion among UN members who believe that there must be change. Uh, it's not just us. Uh, uh, you have uh, entire Africa, entire Latin America left out, uh, developing countries vastly underrepresented. I, I think the state of the world, this was an organization invented in 1945. It's 2023. And when you would have to guess for a year when this will happen, what would it be? No, I, I wouldn't guess because I know the complexities of this process. You know, it's, it's a tough one, I, I'd be honest with you. It's a tough one, but I don't think because it's a tough one, we should give up. Uh, on the contrary, I think because it's a tough one, we should actually up the ante, uh, increase the, uh, the uh, feeling in, in wide parts of the world that this reform is absolutely essential. Thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure.